we're going to be second in our brain metastases seminar series on brain metastases management um, with Dr. Patel tonight. Um, just a few announcements before we get started. Uh, next week, we're going to have our journal club. And then the following week after that will be our Brain Mets Grand Round. A few other things to be that we have upcoming. Um, our student networking event is going to take place on March 23rd. And uh, just a reminder that the Growth Records Journey is live every Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern. And we also are starting a Houston Family Service Program uh, and have an upcoming meeting on March 24th. Uh, and lastly, all of the videos that we have from all of our educational events can be found in our video library at neurosurgerytraining.org and also on our YouTube. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it off to Nick to introduce Dr. Patel for the night and take myself off the screen. Give me one second here. Hey, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Patel. He's a fellowship trained neurosurgeon with a special focus in neuro-oncology. Dr. Patel joined the neurosurgery team at Hackenscheck Meridian Jersey Shore University Medical Center as co-director of the neurosurgical oncology program. Prior to joining, Dr. Patel was a surgical neuro-oncology fellow and clinical instructor at Miami Miller School of Medicine, training under Dr. Komatar. He completed his skull base in neuro-oncology fellowship at Lenox Hill Hospital in New York while training under Dr. David Langer and Dr. John Bookbar. Dr. Patel completed his medical education at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson School of Medicine, graduating with AOA honors and being inducted into the Arnold P. Goldman Humanism Society. Uh, Dr. Patel, we'd like to thank you for being here with us tonight, and I'll turn it over to you. Awesome, guys. Thank you so much for having me. Um, can you guys hear me clearly? <clears throat> yes. Okay, I want to bring up my slides. You can see them there. Put it in play mode. Let me just swap displays. All right, you guys seeing presentation mode or the actual slides? We see the actual slides. Perfect. So thanks for the introduction, guys. And of course, thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, it's pretty exciting. You know, I think, um, you know, I, I've met your your founder of the organization before. I think you um, sort of has worked with the Rutgers Neurosurgery Program before, which was kind of cool. And uh, I had a chance to read up a little bit about the organization. It's pretty awesome. And I had heard about it, you know, but... Um, it, this opportunity gave me some time to look at it in detail. So uh, as you guys had mentioned, you know, I uh, serve as the co-director of the Neurosurgical Oncology Program. I'm a uh, brain and spine tumor neurosurgeon at Hackensack Meridian Health. Um, my office is at, based at Jersey Shore University Hospital. It's pretty awesome. We're like two miles from the beach. And I serve as an assistant professor in the Department of Neurosurgery at uh, Hackensack Meridian School of Medicine uh, in North Jersey. So um, it's you know, I'm, I consider myself very lucky to be able to do what I do. Uh, I get to practice what I love to do for a living and also teach and educate medical students um, and fellows, etc. So it's pretty rewarding. Um, I'm going to talk to you guys about brain metastasis management. Uh, it's, you know, appropriate. I literally just came home about an hour and a half ago from a brain metastasis surgery that I did. So it was kind of nice to sort of, um, you know, uh, practice and, and preach at the same time. So um, I do encourage you guys to, uh, you know, check us, uh, check me out on Instagram. You guys can follow. I put my cases up. You know, I'm available for anyone to reach out. Feel free to shoot me a DM if you want advice or come shadow, whatever it may be. We can definitely arrange it. Uh, I also kept this talk uh, appropriate for medical students uh, as a reference for you to learn from in the future. Um, because there are a lot of things that I, when I was in medical school, didn't fully understand. And I felt that this talk was an appropriate uh, venue for me to help explain some of those things to obviously help the medical students that are currently in school. So with that, you know, um, you know brain tumors, they sort of encompass a wide range of diagnoses uh, and entities. Um, tumor does not equal cancer. And more often than not, lesions are benign and um, even found incidentally. For example, a patient may have a car accident, get their head scanned as part of the trauma workup, and lo and behold, there's a brain tumor. Um, that happens more often than you think. Regardless, the general breakdown for brain tumors is primary versus secondary. Secondary being metastatic, coming from somewhere else. Primary brain tumors are those that originate in the brain and often stay in the brain. It's not always the case, but often that is the case. Um, secondary brain tumors are those that come from somewhere else, like a metastasis. 
Over half a million brain tumors are uh, diagnosed each year. And that number is likely an underestimate. It's because of the data. The data is always lagging behind reality. Primary brain tumors, just a quick little review here, um, described as low-grade gliomas, high-grade gliomas, glioblastoma, primary CNS lymphoma, pituitary tumors, intracranial meningioma, vestibular schwannoma. These are all examples of primary brain tumors. Not an, not an exhaustive list, of course, but nonetheless, some of the more common things we see in practice. But our talk is focused on metastatic brain tumors or secondary brain tumors. These are 10 times more common than any primary brain neoplasm. Um, they're more common than, uh, you know, for, so I'd say, with the exception of meningiomas. But this probably has to do with detection. I'd probably say if you scan 100 people, uh, surprisingly decent percent would actually have a meningioma somewhere in their intracranial space. Probably small and insignificant, but nonetheless there. Um, in fact, nearly a quarter uh, to half of all systemic cancer patients, that's the real numbers are about 20 to 40 percent, but, you know, close enough to a quarter to half um, of those that have systemic cancer will develop a brain tumor, the top three being lung, breast, and melanoma. And we'll sort of, you know, break down things further as we move along. At first, I want to start off with basic education, how we describe brain tumors. You know, brain tumors are often looked at um, uh, from a uh, location-based approach. Um, we call this intra and extraaxial. Intraaxial lesions are within the parenchyma. The purple here, you can see my cursor, um, this is one example of an intraaxial lesion. Axial meaning within the confines of the brain parenchyma, or the brain, the, the mass of the brain itself, um, and sort of within the tissue. Yeah. Metastatic tumors are intraaxial. So our primary brain tumors such as gliomas. Meningiomas, however, are extraaxial. Extraaxial lesions press on the brain and sort of grow outside of it. It's orange in these pictures here. Um, especially, you know, the ventricular space, you can have ventricular tumors, those are also considered extraaxial. So the question is how do they get there? In, we have a, a pretty nice diagram on the next slide, but, you know, basically a tumor cell or cells decide to break off. Uh, this makes it, you know, this sort of, sort of makes its way into the bloodstream. Uh, and it keeps traveling until it gets stuck somewhere. And if we sort of backtrack a little bit to better understand this, you know, uh, we call this hematogenous spread. And if you think about the blood vessels in the body, when they leave the heart, they're the largest diameter. They make their way up to the brain, and the brain gets <clears throat> a large portion of the largest share of blood from the heart um, and also has a seemingly infinitely long um, highway of blood vessels. It's a perfect trap for these cells to lodge into. As the vessels get more and more distal from the heart, they get smaller. And that's why you often see brain mats near the gray-white junction. Of note, Although the most common site for brain mats are the cerebral hemispheres, I mean the two sides of the brain, when there's a new lesion in the cerebellum, for example, which is sort of the, in the posterior fossa, um, for adult cases especially, the top of the differential diagnosis list is metastasis. So let's talk a little bit more about the hematogenous realm, spread by blood vessels. As I said earlier, here's a schematic of it, a single or group of cells metastatic clones break off. They then push through the basement vessel of these blood vessels, uh, sort of ba uh, base membrane of the blood vessel, make their way into the bloodstream, and they hitch a ride. They hitch a ride on lymphocytes or platelets or a cluster of these cells. And they slowly make their way through the bloodstream until they meet a point to which they can no longer travel or sort of blockade. It's a nice landing spot or a trap point, meaning a distal small vessel as it gets narrower and narrower. At this point it lodges and then the cells do what they do best. They start invading through tissue. And this is how a metastatic lesion forms. And these terminal vessels, or I should say these terminal large vessels before they become capillaries, are right near that gray-white junction. These are what we call the M4 vessels, or you know, the P4 vessels, or the A4 vessels sort of branching off and going towards the cortex. Another method of spread is through lymph the lymphatic system. Some cancers take advantage of this process, especially when close to lymphatic tissues. 
you know, we'll use the example of colon cancer. In the GI tract, you have something called the mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue. It's called the malt tissue. And the reason why we have this is one to protect us. Our GI tracts are dirty places, right? Our bodies are a tube within a tube, as you've learned in biology. And as a result, you know, our bodies have to have a strong defense on the mucosal lining of our GI tract. And the best way to do that is to basically line the GI tract with lymphoid tissue or immune cell tissue. This is called the mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue. And what can happen is you can have, let's say, a colon cancer cell in the colon, decide to branch off and go right to these lymphatic tissues, hijack the lymphatic highway, and make its way somewhere else and metastasize. As for the brain, we're still learning a little bit about the lymphatics of the brain. We also call them the sort of the glymphatics, the glymphatic system. Glym meaning, you know, sort of associated with the glioma, uh, glial cells, I should say. Um, as far as, you know, how to envision it, you know, there's thought that it's intimately involved with the venous and CSF circulation of the brain. I found these two schematics here um, in one of the textbooks to trying to visualize this. But you can see, you know, you have your CSF flow, the brain CSF uh, exchange, and then the perivenous efflux. The blood has to go somewhere, and so does the venous drainage. And there's lymphoid, there's lymphoid tissue that's intimately associated with it. So we don't fully understand it yet. Um, but there's lots of good research going on for this. In fact, some of it's even correlating to these primary brain tumors, such as gliomas. Finally, the other route is the most intuitive. This is called localized spread. This is an example of a scalp lesion. And you'll see on the left side here, um, this image here was taken from a 2015 paper. And uh, you can see this large mass on the temporal side of this patient's um, uh, left side of their head. And this is sort of growing through the skin, through the skull, in towards the brain, and eroding through the tissue. And this is a metastatic lesion, theoretically, right? It's spreading through tissues, uh, metastasizing towards the brain. And it's probably more appropriate to say invading towards the brain. But it's leaving its confines of where it originated and going through tissues, basically metastasizing, so to speak. Um, this is a squamous cell carcinoma lesion. It can, like I said, aggressively grow right through the scalp, through the skull, and intracranial, into the intracranial space to push onto the brain. This would be extraaxial, okay? It's pushing on the brain. These tumors are often very aggressive and require a multidisciplinary approach. This includes a neurosurgeon, a plastic surgeon, sometimes a vascular surgeon. Um, the goal is not only brain decompression, but also tumor removal, cranial reconstruction, and scalp reconstruction, and oftentimes facial reanimation, because a lot of the facial nerves that control function, and it's these simple things you take for granted, like closing your eyes, you know, wrinkling your forehead, smiling, you know, raising your eyebrows, these nerves get damaged. And to help these patients out to sort of have some degree of quality of life, especially in their day-to-day -day interactions, oftentimes facial reanimation surgery or the skill of a plastic surgeon is necessary in addition to the skills of a neurosurgeon. Before we dive a little deeper, I want to briefly touch upon staging versus grading. Now, when I was a medical student, this often confused me. Staging is how far the cancer is spread. This depends on tumor size, degree of invasion, and locations of spread. Some boundaries may exist as well. For example, if beyond the diaphragm, oftentimes a systemic cancer, if it spreads from the abdominal area to beyond the diaphragm, it's either grade three or four, by definition. Now, when things metastasize to the brain, it's almost virtually always grade four, because the brain is a fairly distal site for most of the systemic cancers to spread to. Grading, on the other hand, is how abnormal the cells are. And this means how they look under the microscope. Um, you know, apparently there's a lot more to know than simply what we learned in, in, you know, in grade school about mitochondria being the powerhouse of the, powerhouse of the cell. It's probably the only thing most of us remember from grade school. But it's also the shape of the nucleus, the cytoplasmic content, the cytoplasmic organelle ratio, and other components, including mitotic rates, um, which can be assessed, scored objectively and subjectively to come up with the sort of grading of the lesion. A higher grade lesion will have more abnormalities, more mitoses, cells growing faster. Cells that grow faster there are often unregulated and will have all kinds of abnormalities in their nuclei, in their cytoplasm, and their cellular proteins and components, and their shapes. And sometimes what you'll see 
is these areas may also have abnormal blood vessels. Unregulated growth means there's not normal blood vessel growth. You need to have blood vessels to feed these growing cells. And this can also, you know, also have characteristic findings such as pseudonecrosis, meaning tissue that looks dead but really isn't because of the rapid rate of growth. So let's now circle back. How do we work up a newly diagnosed suspected brain metastasis? It's a systematic approach. Um, to sort of, uh, you know, I'm going to go into um, uh, some images for you guys uh, on the next slide. Um, and this will sort of give you guys an idea. Uh, but the first image that's often ordered is a CAT scan of the head, a CT head. And this is because oftentimes a patient will present to the office or to the ER, more likely actually the ER, and they'll have symptoms. You know, this is what, the, you know, it's basically what brought the patient to the attention of their care provider, whether that's an ER doctor, a neurosurgeon, a neurologist, or their primary care doctor. The CAT scan is a great image because it's a quick an easy way to see if there's really something uh, outrageous going on. Bleeding, uh, a large mass, shifting of the brain towards one direction, or a lot of swelling in the brain. All tip offs that there's something underlying. Um, and therefore the CAT scan will often lead to an MRI with and without contrast. Uh, and subsequently a core body image, such as a CAT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Um, also you can get a PET scan. And I'll sort, of, I'll sort of show you guys what these things mean. Uh, PET scans just aren't always easy to get. But if you think about it, if you're suspecting a brain metastasis, then you want to work up the rest of the body trying to find the source. Um, because oftentimes, if you can identify the source, it can determine whether or not you're going to operate on that brain metastasis. So here's some images that we can look at, and we'll break these down. Like I said earlier, CAT scans are the quickest image that is often obtained. Uh, use of contrast is not mandatory, okay? Um, because the MRI that's probably going to subsequently be obtained will have contrast, and that'll help delineate what's going on with better resolution. Um, however, sometimes MRIs may be contraindicated. What that means is that the patient may have a metal implant or other issue in their body that sort of precludes them from getting an MRI. Okay? Um, the patient may also have uh, some other metal implant somewhere else that's not MRI compatible, meaning it's magnetic. Um, Additional, you know, workup studies, you know, can also be obtained. CAT scans of the chest, out and pelvis, as I said, you'll see this here on the right, uh, along with the PET scan, for example, which you'll also see on the right, a body PET scan. They can help identify other areas or the primary source. Sometimes these can be biopsied in lieu of the brain lesion and avoid a brain surgery if you don't need it. For example, if you find a patient with lung cancer and a lung metastasis is suspected in the brain, if that lung metastasis is not causing a lot of issues, you can often just treat it with radiation and or chemotherapy without having to operate on it. And we'll talk about that in subsequent slides. Um, and, you know, like I said, you can just uh, biopsy these other areas because it's always safer to biopsy something other than the brain oftentimes. And we'll talk about surgical indication later as well. Note that the two images on the left this CAT scan here and this MRI are actually two different tumors in two different patients. Although they are similar as sort of the location, I just wanted to illustrate, you know, two examples, clear examples of what a CAT scan can show you versus an MRI. Okay, and I'm going to dive into these on subsequent slides. Um, lastly, you know, the right side images, these are the PET scans. And you can see this PET scan was obtained on this side here, corresponding to this area that was seen on the CAT scan. It was suspicious for being a lesion obviously hard to see for the untrained eye, right? But the PET scan makes it stand out. Um, you know, one thing I do want to sort of mention, the basis of PET scans, which is this image here, right? It's based on metabolic activity. Cancer cells grow more rapidly and therefore are hotter. They're more metabolically active than normal tissue, and therefore they will show up on a PET scan better than normal tissue. Notice how the rest of the abdomen here is pretty dark, not too hot. Let's break down the CAT scan. Uh, in this example, this is a CT head, and we have three views here. We have an axial, we have a coronal, and a sagittal. Okay. Um, and, you know, the lesion itself is very obvious. It's sort of this black hole here, right? We call this hypodense. The word dense is used to describe CAT scans, hyper or hypo or iso. And it's relative to the, how the brain looks, okay? 
um, the normal brain is here in reference. The lesion is here, and in between it's just dark here. This is edema, this is swelling, because this lesion is pushing on the normal brain. On the other two views, we get a more deeper understanding of the location of the lesion. On the coronal and the sagittal, and we get a better understanding of the composition of this lesion. It looks mostly dark, right? And if you look closely, this is the ventricular space of the brain with their CSF. CSF is fluid. CSF is dark as well. And therefore, this lesion is also dark, which would be highly suspicious for this lesion to be primarily fluid. Um, also, again, note the location here. It's close to the gray-white junction. You know, gray matter being here, white matter being here, and it's sort of right in that area, right? which is what we talked about earlier. There's an MRI. Again, this is a different lesion than what we saw in the prior example, a different patient, actually, but very similar. Now, in here, there's contrast that's been injected, giving contrast enhancement. We call this the intensity level. Well, a lesion can be hyper, iso, or hypo intense relative to the brain. Now, in this case, this lesion is hyper intense relative to the brain, meaning it's much brighter than the brain because it's enhancing with contrast. This tumor is avidly enhancing, super bright, pretty homogeneous. Sometimes the enhancement can be patchy in the center of lesion, uh, especially if uh, the lesion is growing very fast. The lesion grows so fast it outgrows its blood supply. No longer gets enough food, and the cells start dying in the center. We call this necrosis in the center. And this can often appear as sort of a black cavity within the center of a surrounding area of enhancement. Some additional imaging we can get is called connectomics, which is relatively new. Something called quick tome. Now, this is not going to be a metastatic tumor, but it does illustrate the point. This is a primary brain tumor, a high-grade glioma. But this image, this sort of video will demonstrate two points to you. One, what connectomics is about. And two, what it looks like when the tumor grows very fast and the center becomes necrotic. Okay? So I'm going to play through this, and hopefully this is playing for you guys. But this is three views, an axial, coronal, and sagittal view. And what it's showing you is this tumor relative to the motor and sensory fibers of the brain. It's pretty awesome that you can map this out for an individual patient and see exactly how close this tumor here is to those fibers because this can help you plan your surgery. So here's another imaging modality that's now available to us. In fact, here at New Jersey, we're one of the, I think the first or one of the few institutions actually doing this that has a system. Uh, we do this pretty much standard for any intraaxial case that's involving high real and real estate, such as the motor areas or speech areas. And it really gives us an idea and sort of uh, an additional safety net as to knowing where exactly the motor fibers are that are serving the patient's motor functions, like moving their arms or legs. So once a brain lesion is suspected of being a metastasis, the decision-making process for surgical intervention is critical. Not all brain metastatic lesions need surgery. However, if there is suspicion that a brain lesion's tissue composition is unclear, even in the setting of an established systemic cancer, for example, lung cancer is known in a patient and then they have a new brain lesion, but it, the brain lesion doesn't necessarily look like lung cancer, it looks at all unusual, meaning the diagnosis or composition is unclear, then surgical intervention can be considered, especially because it may change the way the therapy is delivered. The first thing we do is determine how many lesions there are. Next, lesion size, edema, and neurological symptoms. This can help determine if surgery is indicated uh, or not. And I sort of created this little diagram yesterday um, for any students that are interested for a quick and dirty way to, uh, you know, to look at how we make decisions. So again, metastasis is the solitary, is it a single? Is it bigger than three centimeters? Is there a lot of edema? Are there neurological deficits? Or do we need tissue for diagnosis? It could be one of those four or all of those. And that can determine if you need surgery versus going towards chemo or radiation. If there's multiple lesions, if any one of the single lesions or more than one lesion is causing some of the symptoms to the left, meaning these, you can justify a surgical resection for those. However, you wouldn't chase all of them because some of the other ones, one, would put a patient at a risk you shouldn't take, and you can actually treat them with chemo or radiation instead. So if surgery is about to be taken, there are additional options. Open surgery, such as craniotomy, or a tubular approach. Tubular, I'll talk about in a bit. You're going to want some pictures for that, trust me, to better understand it. Or a stereotactic needle biopsy and, stereo, uh, and sort of laser-induced thermal therapy. We'll talk about that, too. Before we dive into that, I do want to explain the word stereotactic to you as students. 
So stereotax is something we use in a neurosurgical OR. Um, you know, some of you may have heard of it before or have seen it. And, you know, forgive me if I'm explaining something you already know. But before surgery, a very high-resolution MRI is obtained of the patient's head. Lots of thin slices. These are some images I found online. Um, it's, it's pretty standard in any tumor case nowadays. But before surgery, a high-resolution MRI is obtained of the patient's head. This is then uploaded into a stereotactic software, which lives on this machine here in this image. Another version of that machine is back here. Okay? And the program creates a 3D replica of the patient's head. And you can see it right on the screen back here. Now, the patient, once asleep, is positioned such that his or her head is fixed into a three-pin head holder. You can see this patient, although it looks like there's only two pins, one of these arms has two pins on it, the other one has one pin, so three pins altogether. The head holder has a special reflective device on it, and you'll see it right here. It's called a reflective star. That's this blue thing right here. It's four spokes on it, and it's attached to his head holder. The stereotactic computer slash software has a sensor you'll see up here. This sensor can pick up the reflective tips of this star. So now the computer and software know where their star is and they know where the patient's head is relative to that star. To fine tune it, you can then take this wand that the surgeon's holding here, which also has reflective tips on it. You trace the patient's scalp with that and the sensor picks it up. Now the tracing is over the patient's facial anatomy. The software will then know where the patient's head is relative to this fixed star and how all of that correlates to the 3D model that's on the computer. This literally allows for a tailored open. You can literally tailor opening. You can literally point the exact trajectory you need to take to get to a tumor with sub-millimeter accuracy often. So let's talk about open surgery. The first two of the three surgical options, open craniotomy or tubular approaches. For an open craniotomy, this is one of my cases, we'll make a skin incision, right? And a standard craniotomy is planned to make the skin incision. We do it with the smallest incision possible. The skull opening is often right above the target trajectory, right? Sometimes these lesions are on the surface, like in this case. You literally open the skull in the dura and you're staring at the tumor. We can then carefully resect the tumor using microinstruments and by manual resection. In this picture, you can see the darker circumscribed area that corresponds to the tumor and the yellow-red tissue around it corresponding to the brain. So here's the tumor itself, and this sort of yellow-red tissue here is the brain and its blood vessels. Okay, and the patient's head is here. Here's that reflective star that we talked about earlier. That helped me identify the exact approach to get to this thing by making an incision that was maybe smaller than, uh, probably say this is maybe about two and a half inches, this incision. Maybe, maybe three. Let's talk about tubular approaches. Tubular approaches utilize a plastic tube that can be introduced into the brain to access a given lesion. It's optimal for deeper seated lesions, things that are not on the surface, and you don't want to disrupt too much of the brain. The nice thing is that it sort of balances visibility with tissue and tissue damage. Um, traditional paddle retractors are things you can place in to retract the brain can exert circum a sort of unidirectional pressure. This does a radial pressure, theoretically. And it's kind of nice. You can do this all through a very small opening. You can see this is actually for one of our cases on the top right. Um, this incision actually is very small. This is probably, I'd say, two and a half inches. The diameter of this tube is only two inches. And you can access a deep lesion in the brain with this and resect it out. Again, smaller incisions and smaller craniotomies, faster recovery. Some surgical notes. Bleeding risk and vasculature are often important to note, especially with cases of melanoma, right, or other vascular entities, or renal cancer, for example. Highly vascular, they can often bleed on you and become very challenging to resect. So you gotta be cautious to know what you're dealing with before you get into it, and make sure your surgical team is prepared. Visualization is also a challenge. Sometimes, depending on the angle of the lesion and the opening you have to make, sometimes you can't go through a blood vessel. So you have to position the patient appropriately to get there. Another thing to think about is sort of making sure you have enough illumination. Deep lesions are hard to see. If you wear a headlight so you can see deep into the cavity. Lastly, tissue composition. Sometimes these lesions aren't obvious. You can't distinguish them from brain. And it's hard to say what's tumor versus brain. And that's where it's sort of important to have that sort of skill set, the training to identify these things. Lastly, the goals of resection. 
it's important to identify what you expect to handle or what you expect to get out from the patient before you start diving in there and dealing with it. If you're not expecting a gross total resection, there's no need to be a hero and put the patient at risk. The last thing you want to do is hurt the patient. Another point is steps for resection. Do you dive into the tumor and take out the center of it and then work outwards? Or do you work outward and try to scoop it up in one piece? That depends on the tumor size, its location, the surrounding tissue, and how easily or how fragile it is. Sometimes it's a fluid-filled sac, like a ball of fluid. It's going to pop if you, you know, try to manipulate it too much. Sometimes it's hard as a rock and comes out of one piece. I talked earlier about laser-induced thermal therapy. This is one of those sort of older but also newer techniques. It stems from radiofrequency ablation. And what you do is you stick a probe uh, through the skull directly into a target and deliver an ablative dose of energy to destroy the lesion. With the advent of real-time MRI visualization, meaning you can get MRIs while the surgery is being done constantly, every seven seconds, and get a quick little image to show you how much you've done. Um, you can actually watch the delivery of ablative energy, and it's photon-based, it's laser-based. Um, it's a strong tool in the neurosurgical armamentarium, and indications depend on the lesion location and features uh, as shown in this decision tree. Is it a deep-seated lesion? Is it greater than three centimeters? Is there a lot of edema? If so, then you might have consider open resection as opposed to a laser. However, if it's not, you can consider a laser therapy. Um, the nice thing about this is it can all be, it can all be done through a three millimeter opening. Um, I would use the word tic tac, but some of you uh, younger students may not necessarily be as familiar with tic tac sizes. But let's talk about the AirPods that we all probably own. That stem of your AirPod, right, is about five to six millimeters. Um, this is opening is smaller than that. So that gives you an idea of how small this opening is. And you can drop a laser in, and this is the pre-op image above here. This is the post-op image here. Laser goes in, burns the tissue, and that's why it looks like this. Remember, you're not removing the tissue, you're just damaging it and burning it in real time. And you can watch it literally just melt. Post-operatively, these patients will go to the neurointensive care unit, and you know, most craniotomy patients spend about one to two nights in their ICU after surgery. Depending on a variety of factors, age, comorbidities, and such, obviously older patients, you have to be more cautious. But often patients can be downgraded or even ready for discharge on the day after surgery. In fact, we practice an enhanced recovery approach at our institution. We try to get our patients home as fast as possible, we try to get them bed as, out of bed as fast as possible. The whole point is when patients look sick or lay, are laying around, they will feel sicker. The goal is to get them back to doing what they do, even if that's simply walking in the hospital, sitting upright to eat their meals, you know, walking around the hallways with a nursing or physical therapy staff member. It just feels good to do those things. For laser ablation cases, uh, the patients are almost always ready to be discharged the day after surgery. Let's dive into after surgery things. So let's talk about chemotherapy and immunotherapy. I'm not a medical oncologist. You know, as a surgical neuro-oncologist, I focus on the surgical aspects of brain tumors and spine tumors. But to help guide our audience, I figured it would be important to you all to understand two of the major categories of adjuvant therapies outside of radiation, chemo and immunotherapy. There's huge variability as to which is indicated, and within each category, there are a ton of options. Depending on where the MET came from, I mean, where the metastasis came from, lung, breast, melanoma, and such, the therapy can vary wi widely. We're not going to dive into individual drugs here. I mean, that could be a series of lectures in itself. Probably better served by a, an actual medical or, or, uh, or, or sort of body oncologist. But for quick definitions, we've all heard of the word chemotherapy. And immunotherapy, some of you may have heard of as well. It can be confusing as to what they're doing. Chemotherapy are toxic agents designed to be taken up by cancer cells as they're fast growing. Cancer cells think they're normal agents, they take them up, and it turns out they're like cyanide for the cells. The cancer cells slowly die off because they're incorporated these poisons into them. Immunotherapy are agents designed to help the body's immune system identify and target cancer cells. For example, pembrolizumab. Way to remember this is with the AB at the end, often for an, the word antibody. What it does is it helps, you know, sort of tag these cancer cells based on the receptors and the immune system sees the tags and destroys the cells. 
So it's kind of using its body's own systems against it, which is kind of nice. And it's newer than the standard chemotherapy drugs. And they can be used together as well. Let's talk about radiation. Now, as a medical student, this often confused me a lot. Um, you know, the term radiation, you know, you're thinking like Chernobyl, or like, you know, if you watch that on, uh, what is it, HBO Max or whatever it was, or you're thinking about like, you know, cell towers and things like that. But in medicine, you know, radiation has sort of two very broad categories, internal radiation and external radiation. Many of you are familiar with external radiation. You've heard of it before, patients getting it. But internal radiation is something called brachytherapy, okay? And sort of brachytherapy is slow therapy, okay? What that means is you can deliver a small radiation dose or radiation seed based on some sort of radioisotope into the surgical cavity right after resection. And this will slowly deliver a radiation dose to that surrounding tissue over time. And eventually it will degrade and basically, you know, sort of dissolve, so to speak, or, you know, be non-effective anymore, but it kind of delivers a nice dose of radiation right then and there directly to the tissue. And it's implanted in the patient. External radiation is what you think of when you picture radiation treatment of medicine, sort of patient going into some machine and getting radiated. Let's talk a little bit more about external radiation. So this is where things can get confusion, uh, confusing. Um, you know, the types of radiation can be quite confusing. I'm going to do my best to help establish at least a foundation for you all. Again, I'm not a radiation oncologist, and therefore I imagine the true physics of this are far more complicated. But I'll do my best here. So we'll start off on the left. Whole brain radiation. It's just that. Many lesions represented by these red sort of pentagons inside of this blue oval or head with these yellow arrows pointing towards it representing radiation. The entire brain is radiated in the whole brain. Next is intensely mod intensity modulated radiation therapy, also known as IMRT. It's more focal. The radiation beams can be directed at a specific area in a single direction with a good degree of accuracy. And the beams are sort of directed in one direction at a time to contour the lesions. That's why it says one, two, three, the first beam then you have a second beam and a third beam sort of in sequence. Next is sort of stereotactic radiation. And what this does is it delivers multiple rays simultaneously to a single target area with a high degree of accuracy and precision. This can be in the form of stereotactic radiosurgery or radiotherapy, okay? The beams summate to deliver the desired radiation dose. Back to the terms radiation therapy and radiosurgery. Radiation therapy is usually fractionated, meaning divided. The intended dose is divided between multiple sessions, fractionated, multiple days, etc. And the patient comes back for them. Stereotactic radio surgery is the entire radiation dose delivered at once to a given target. Finally, this proton therapy. It's just sort of new, but it sort of contours very nicely. It's a different type of source of radiation, but can also be used for certain types of tumors that are resistant to the other therapies. It's also very precise and accurate, even more so sometimes in the other forms, which is kind of nice for highly eloquent areas that are close to, let's say, the optic chiasm or the pituitary gland, or other important structures like the uh, hearing nerves, like the vestibular nerves, et cetera, or the brainstem. With that, I'm going to sort of talk a little bit about future directions. As I said earlier, brachy means slow. Brachytherapy is often a method to slowly deliver radiation internally to a patient by leaving radiation seeds or implants in the tumor cavity. Future directions include something called Gamatel. It's a relatively newer product, so to speak, on the market. Uh, we're going to be starting, uh, we're actually already started using it here at our institution. But what it does is it uses cesium-131 at its radioisotope. These cesium seeds are impregnated into this sort of collagen disc, or not disc, I say a little square patty, and you can kind of just vaguely see the seeds here, these two little black spots here. And then after the surgery, remove, uh, surgery removes the tumor, the surgeon can actually place these sort of in the cavity. And you can see it on this CAT scan here, one, two, three, four, sort of in contour the cavity with them. And what these do is they deliver a radiation dose immediately, just beginning right during the surgery. And it's kind of nice because 
What this does is it avoids waiting the usual 14 days or so to start radiation after traditional approaches. You have to wait 14 days or so, maybe 10 days for certain surgeons or longer because you want to make sure the wound is healing before you start radiating again. Radiation is not good for healing wounds either. They'll break down. You don't want that. So this kind of sort of helps you jump start it a lot earlier. And the best part about this is you can calculate the dose of radiation that this sort of device is delivering and actually fract uh, factor that into the external radiation you're going to give them later on. So they can get still get their standard chemo and radiation therapy. Pretty nice stuff. Uh, it's one of the future directions. I'm excited to see where this goes. You know, we're currently in talks to start using it for not just brain metastasis or large brain metastasis, but also recurrent gliomas as well, uh, and potentially other tumors. So, um, you know, I imagine a lot of you who will be entering into you know, residency training or your own careers at some point in the next five to ten years will be seeing more and more devices like this, uh, not just in neurosurgery, but other aspects of medicine as well. Um, with that said, I know it's 846. I'm going to leave some time for questions. I just want to say thank you to our uh, neurosurgery department at Hackensack Meridian, Jersey Shore, and Hackensack Meridian School of Medicine. I've got a pretty awesome brain tumor team here. Uh, I would not be able to do what I do every day without my team, uh, including my neuro-oncologist, my co-director, Dr. Maggio, uh, and our nurse practitioners and our other colleagues, including radiation oncology, all oncology and neuropathology in the neuro ICU. So definitely thank you to them. I'm going to leave this slide up for a little bit for you guys. Um, if you want to give me an email, feel free to. There's my email. Any of you guys can email me anytime with questions, guidance, whatever you need. Same thing on Instagram or Twitter. You can follow me at Patel underscore neurosurgery or uh, on Twitter at Patel uh, NV. Uh, and then my email is my first name dot last name at hmhn.org. And with that, I will close that. Stop sharing my screen in a second. You guys can see me? Yep, we're good. I hope that was good. I hope that was appropriate for you guys. Yeah, that was excellent. Thank you so much for your time. Um, of course. Uh, for everybody that's watching, feel free to throw your questions in the chat. But while we wait for those, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about kind of the, the overlap of specialties. I was actually talking about this with a friend the other day, particular to brain tumors, um, sort of where the interaction between neurosurgery and radiation oncology and medical oncology and kind of how you all interact with each other and kind of where your role ends and theirs begins. Yeah, you know, I think um, it's a very important question. We often use a multidisciplinary approach. You know, believe it or not, we'll have a, let's say we have a patient with a brain tumor coming in um, to the hospital, we'll often see the patient, and oftentimes a neurosurgeon is called first, um, just because you know most folks who are not familiar with the brain tumor will sort of have a bit of a panic attack and like we need to call a surgeon right away. It doesn't need to come out. So my general approach is I often will see the see the patient, see the images, and I'm going to determine the patient's surgery right off the bat. That's going to be my decision often. If I'm unsure, I will contact my oncology team. Uh, or my radiation oncologist say, hey, look, I'm not sure if I should take this out. I don't want to do the wrong thing. And is this something we can radiate instead? Or is this something we can treat with chemotherapy? And oftentimes they'll get back to me right away and be like, no, this is not appropriate for that. You should take it out. And everyone's very honest, right? We want to do the right thing for the patient. This is not a game of like, you know, who gets the patient. It's what's the best safe route for the patient. And that's what we often go with. But it's certainly a multidisciplinary approach. Um, and even after, we have these weekly tumor boards. We, it's, it's a radiation oncology team, a pathology team, neuro-oncology, regular oncology, neurosurgery. We're all sitting in a room. Like it's, a, it's like it's like a war room, and we're going over every case, what we're doing for the case, what we're doing for the patient, what the follow-up is going to be. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, also, with regard to uh, the specifically like stereotactic radiosurgery, I was just curious if that's typically... Or can you be a radiation oncologist and do that? Because I've seen it more from the neurosurgery yes. side. And is that an area of overlap as well? Yeah, no, certainly. I think um, if you're interested in, let's say, if you were a medical student interested in, stere in sort of uh, radio stereotactic radio surgery, you thought it was you know, pretty awesome. I often tell patients you should strongly consider, I'm sorry, I often tell students you should strongly consider a career in radiation oncology. Because in fact, when the patient goes for that therapy, whether it's Gamma Knife or Linac or whatever it may be, it's a radiation oncologist actually calling most of the shots. The neurosurgeon is involved, don't get me wrong. 
but you know that's their territory. We're there to make sure that they understand what we resected and what we didn't, and just to sort of be a a, a second check on their dosing if it makes sense. But I by no means you know would ever you know supersede a radiation oncologist's call on that. I mean they, this is what they do for a living, and yet we have, you know we have some excellent people with us, which is we're very grateful. Um, so you know they call the shots and literally the shots, the radiation shots. And, um, you know, we go based on what they say. Okay. That's really interesting that there's, you know, so many different pathways you can take if that's something yeah. that you're interested in. Um, I was also curious, more of a technical question with regard to uh, the gamma tiles or if you are delivering uh, radiation immediately in the operating room, kind of what precautions are being taken when you're dealing with radiation in the operating room? Great question. Um, so, uh, you know, before we had gamma tile in the picture we used to use these uh, cesium-131 strands and i mean it was like some like crazy sci-fi you know <laughs> one of those scenes like you know radiation suits kind of scenarios but you know gamma tile is pretty nice uh it comes like a slim uh lead lined box and uh there aren't there aren't any special precautions i mean there's standard standard safety checks and stuff that are in place but you know um it's not like everyone needs to run out of the room or anything like that <laughs> uh, it's not like that it's th the whole point of it is we have this sort of packing that kind of keeps it contained uh, there's certain regulations and stuff like that. There's like all kinds of legal uh, red tape on it, but uh, it's nothing like you know, uh, like it's like one of those like Simpson scenes where he's like walking with like the pliers, yeah. like, a big piece of radiation. You know, it's not, it's not like that. Yeah. yeah, and then you and then he drops it, of course. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Standard Homer Simpson kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay. It looks like we don't have any questions in the chat yet. Uh, Nick, did you have any anything that came up for you during that talk? Uh, yes, I did. It's more um, along the future directions. Um, so we've been talking about all these cool technologies, and with the recent public interest in AI with like Chat GPT, um, yeah. where does artificial intelligence uh, play a role in tumor surgery currently, if it does? It's a great question. I was trying to bring my buddy Randy D'Amico from Lennox Hill on this. <laughs> Randy just put out a chat GPT. I was talking to Randy earlier, actually. But, um, you know, I, it's it's interesting, you know. Uh, I, I don't know, you know, the whole chat GPT thing is it's almost surreal, scary, but exciting at the same time. I certainly think there's a role for it in, in writing scholarly work, uh, which is part of, you know, the neuro-oncology, neurosurgical oncology field. Um, as far as surgical planning or indications, it's hard to say. Perhaps you can use AI to help you uh, sort of navigate like the, what the basically infinite amount of data now online, right? It's like literally. I mean, I, I, I'm old enough to remember a time before we had internet regularly, right? Um, which is like basically the early, uh, mid 90s. We like basically got AOL, which is like that's what we had. But like this didn't exist, right? Like we still, up until like, I don't know sixth seventh grade we're still using like the britannic encyclopedias to get all of our data but nowadays i mean it's already at your fingertip you can look up anything you want so um you know what i will say is i think there's certainly use for it for finding data and finding information um other ai things were often actually something cool that we're using is called raman spectroscopy um i'm not sure if you guys have heard of that but essentially you know right now what we do is we take a piece of tumor we send it to a pathologist to take a look and we call that a frozen specimen sometimes when we're not sure if this is tumor or not. And that can take a half hour or 40 minutes because the pathologists do all their prep work, right, to make sure they can see what they're seeing. Take the tissue, make a slide, et cetera. Raman spectroscopy, basically, you throw the, you make the slide of the operating, take a piece of tissue, slap it on the slide, throw it on the machine. Two minutes later, it pops out this beautiful AI-generated sort of or AI-augmented image kind of giving you what you're looking at. And you can often make a diagnosis before the pathologist can. It's kind of cool. And the, the future of it is going to be, it's going to help, you know, sort of get faster diagnoses. Now, I'm probably also going to be skeptical initially, but, you know, it's it's sort of the inevitable future, right? It's machine learning, AI and stuff, radiographic images too. I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised in the next 10 years if something somebody comes up with a way to basically slap an MRI and put it through an AI system it, it tells you the exact diagnosis without any tissue, right? And that's going to happen. It's It's inevitable. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting. I'm curious in that case um, with the Raman spectroscopy, I've seen it, I've seen images of that um, with spinal tumors. And if you have that, is it sort of protocol to still wait for a pathologist diagnosis? 
situation? Yeah. Okay. We were using it on trial at uh, University of Miami and our general protocol was still wait for the pathologist, but it kind of gave you an idea. Like if you were, you know, oftentimes what happens, we'll do a biopsy and then we'll wait for the pathologist to confirm we got tissue before we close. It kind of gave you an idea. Okay. We definitely have tissue. We can close because that's less time the patient spends on an anesthesia, right? Which makes a difference. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah, I was actually going to pop on and uh, ask a question. Yeah. Uh, hey, Dr. Patel, it's good to see you. Um, hey. So, I mean, I, you know, I have like more of a, a scientific interest in, you know, Nikki as, uh, as an MD, PhD student. I'm sure you're the same. Um, and obviously, there's been a lot going on in terms of molecular markers for tumors and, uh, you know, the uh, role that can play in diagnosis and prognosis or treatment planning. Um, just wondering how you're, you know, integrating that into your practice or how, uh, how it was done during your fellowship training. Yeah, so it's a great question. You know, oftentimes, you know, uh, I think the there's a sort of an enmeshment now between the oncology side and the surgery side. I think both sides are need to learn about each other's work. And um, that's a whole base of a tumor board. So, you know, when we were at the University of Miami, we had a very comprehensive oncology tumor board where we would talk about markers, the patient, and the general protocol of surgery happens, she goes down diagnosis and you get NGX, next generation sequencing. So when that comes back, you get a plethora of positive or negative markers. And you know, anything we can target for therapy is going to be brought up by the both surgical and the oncology team that we discussed. Now at Lennox Hill, we had a pretty unique thing as well. You know, John Bookbar, you know, uh, had a pretty awesome system with intraarture chemotherapy where we would have these tumor boards and we talk about different things to target an IA and arterial drug. So he's actually a great example of a surgeon who's sort of a, a very well national as well. In my practice, um, you know, I literally have a, oh, we have a group chat between my two oncologists and my oncologist and myself, Club of Neuron Mafia. And, uh, you know, any patient that we have a question on or a specific drug or a specific marker, right, it's all about education. I don't know every marker out there. In fact, I'm often kind of learning markers myself because my oncologist, Dr. Correa or Dr. Farouk, that's what they do for a living. Right? So I'll be like, hey, this patient has this marker. Is there anything we can argue with it, right? Um, or they'll be like, hey, this patient doesn't have favorable markers. We can serve with, or, or, you know, surgery for recurrence. Um, and it's a, it's a back and forth. It's a great education opportunity. The other thing I like to utilize is the NCTN guidelines. They're online. They're free. It's got to make an account. It's free for med students to get to. And it's amazing. They literally give you like a perfect you know, decision tree for pretty much any neural oncology Great. I wish I had discovered this as a student or even as a resident. I had discovered it as a fellow uh, or as a new attendant. So it's pretty nice. But bring back your point, there's constant communication between the oncologist uh, and surgeons regarding molecular targets and markers. And that plays a big role as to whether or not it's going to be a revision surgery for a case of recurrence or if we're going to forego surgery and target with medication or immunotherapy or whatever it may be. That's awesome. Thank you. All right. I think with that, we can probably close out here. I don't want to take up too much of your time. You've already generously given us a full hour and given, given us an excellent talk. Um, so again, thank you for your time. If anybody has any questions um, and you didn't catch all of that contact information, please feel free to reach out to us and we will pass that along as well. Yeah, I'll put it back um, up real quick. No okay. Problem. Um, yeah, you guys can see it there for anyone who wants to see it. You can close off with that. All right. So we'll leave that up for a second here um, in case anyone wants to contact Dr. Patel. Otherwise, uh, thank you for joining us tonight. And thank you, Dr. Patel, for your time. Thanks, guys. Let me know if you need any other talks in the future. Happy to give them. I got lots. Yeah. Thank you. Have a great night, everybody. Take care, guys.